Hi all, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence. And I am so excited to be here today with three amazing people from We Are Like Your Child, um, which we will link to in the show notes. Um, so I would love to start out with Emily first, who will introduce herself. And uh, then everyone else will as well, and we'll get going. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so I am Emily Page Ballou, and I have been a co-editor uh, and co-moderator of the blog, uh, We Are Like Your Child, for several years, um, along with uh, Castiana and Steph. I'm also one of the um, co-editors of the new book out from AWN and Beacon Press called We Are Like Your, uh, not We Are Like Your Child, called Sincerely Your Autistic <laughs> Child. Uh, you see why I, that's a little confusing. Um, and when we are not in a pandemic, I am also an off-Broadway stage manager. Awesome. Welcome. Uh, Cassiana? Hi, um, I'm Cassiana Asasamas. I am the reluctant mastermind of We Are Like Your Child, <laughs> which means that I set up the blog and asked people to like write for it and do literally nothing else except for if I write something and I'm like, hey, this isn't going to piss people off too much maybe we should put this on the blog. Um, <laughs> that is pretty much exactly what I do. I also have my own blog, Radical Neurodivergent Speaking, which I haven't written for in a really long time. Um, I mentor autistic and other neurodivergent kids. Um, I have written a wide array of things over the past um, 20 and a bit years now, because I'm actually secretly um, an ageless fairy being. And um, Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's pretty much what I do. I am also an ex-gymnast and current martial artist, and I have a deep and abiding interest in neuroscience. Awesome. Steph? Hi, I'm either Steph or Tuttle. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I have done, spent a lot of time in math education. I had started tutoring math when I was 13, co-founding my school's math um, tutoring program, and ended up continuing on in um, education after I had graduated college, working in um, math tutoring for specifically disabled children, um, including and both K through 12, and then also adults after that um, in community colleges. Um, I also, as well as this, and well, more after this, after, um, am one of the admins of the Facebook group, um, Ask Me I'm an AAC user, um, and have been spending a lot of time there asking a lot of, answering, answering a lot of questions about AAC. That's wonderful. And we'll be sure to link to uh, the Ask Me, I'm an AAC user group, um, and even uh, Radical neuro Neurodivergence, we would love to link to that as well, um, <laughs> because they're both- District 12 neighbors. salute to you. <laughs> District 12 salute to me. <laughs> and we'll link to um, Sincerely, your, your Autistic Child as well. Um, awesome. Okay, so um, I guess if you all want to get started on why are we here today? What are we talking about? Sure. So um, just, to th just to throw in, because it's relevant, um, I thought I should mention, because some people might not be familiar, what is uh, We Are Like Your Child and why it was founded. Um, and We Are Like Your Child uh, is a blog that was um, named after a thing that autistic adults really often hear parents of younger kids say, which is that you're not like my child. Yeah. Um, because parents are not given a lot of good understanding of um, how autistic kids change and grow. We, you know, they, they tend to know a lot about how neurotypical and non-disabled kids grow up, and they just don't know a lot about how autistic kids grow up. And so it can be easy to wind up with a disconnect between what an autistic adult look, looks like and what an autistic um, young child looks like. And so this is something we get told a lot. And back in 2013 or so, um, I, th I think it was Jess at Diary of a Mom was um, kind of one of the, the bigger people pushing for it. But there was there was kind of a fever pitch of um, parents who who said like 
you know, we read a lot about um, autistic pride and things like that, um, but we don't hear a lot about like the struggles that you really have and the challenges that you really have. Uh, and so the blog was founded for autistic and multiply disabled people of all kinds um, to, to talk um, not in catastrophic pathologizing ways, but just in really, um, you know, really, really non-stigmatizing ways about like, what are the challenges that we continue to face as adults and, and how do we deal with them? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm that's kind of... If I may add to that, you know, we it's quite the disingenuous criticism that we get a lot about glorifying autism and our disabilities mm -hmm. and how we don't write mm -hmm. about the challenges, which is flagrantly not true. Yeah. And like you do get mm -hmm. a lot of defensiveness, like where we do have to write about what we're good at more than yeah. we're good at it because we're having <laughs> to defend our right to exist a lot of the time. And so it was like mm -hmm. a place to consolidate actually i write about you know the challenges a lot let mm -hmm. me stick it all over here so that you can read about it all in one place instead of pretending it doesn't exist so it yeah. like it's our kinder gentler blog but there's still like the name is like a it's still kind of like okay but we are so people can choose to read it as a little bit if they want to but it's it's got that double thing but um it's yeah. very much a response to this disingenuous claim. Yeah. So um, the events that brought us here today basically are that um, an occupational therapist who has a public page um, posted a cartoon that he had made for a client. And um, as far as I can remember it, um, it, it was uh, a, a cartoon of a little kid uh, like doing a karate kick at the phrase I can't so that he was kicking the letter T out of the word so that the words read I can instead of I can't. Um, and a few people uh, who included me had um, really negative instinctive reactions to this image. Uh, and we talked a little bit about why in the comments. Um, and uh, to be a little bit fair, I think I truly, truly believe that he wasn't trying to say anything horrible with this cartoon, um, but he was a little bit taken aback um, that so many people had really starkly negative reactions to it um, and and didn't really know why anybody would find this cartoon anything that anything other than um, encouraging and cute. Um, but the thing is that in a whole lot of ways, um, being able to say the words I can't um, get stigmatized in ways, um, even with the best of intentions that have a lot of negative consequences in the lives of disabled kids and, and over the range of our life lifetimes, yeah. um, for autistic and disabled adults. Something I think that's important to add to this is that this is not a type of image that only shows up in this kind of one situation. This is a very common type of image yep. to appear it appears in a lot of schools it appears mm -hmm. in all sorts of special ed classrooms it shows up in dis disability services all over this like all over the place it is a very common imagery mm -hmm. and it's something that we are exposed to all of the time mm -hmm. it yeah, does absolutely. show up in other in other contexts as well i grew up doing gymnastics and it shows up there too um but this year like you know people understand that that is a toxic thing. Like people will tell you that they understand that, whoa, that's toxic. As soon as you apply it to disabled kids, people are like, oh. And so, um, but we were inundated with, you know, don't say I can't mm -hmm. say I can't yet. Or, and that is the like least toxic form of it that I have seen regularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, um, it, it reminds me a little bit of that, that saying that says something like, um, the only disability is a bad attitude. I almost wore that shirt Absolutely. today. <laughs> and no, my other disability is a bad attitude. I need you to understand that. Yeah. Um, so I wanted, I wanted to start off, um, and this is gonna be something that I'm a little bit preaching to the choir about here because I know that um, NJ Ace has had uh, Rabbi Rudy Regan on before. 
Um, and uh, she writes a blog called Real Social Skills. And uh, she also has this concept that she talks about on that blog of an anti-skill. Um, and an anti-skill um, basically is, is um, their rules or their ways of behaving that get taught as social skills um, in the name of, um, you know, teaching kids how to, to deal with the real world. But in reality, they're things that make your life worse and harder because they're not actually how the real world works at all. Um, and I think she said something actually about how, like, we do a lot of teaching kids about how we wish the world was and not about how the world really was. Um, yeah. But so the way that the world really is, not being able or willing to say when you actually cannot do something is an anti-skill and not a skill. Um, it's not a life skill I will to not right be back. able- My yeah. curtain is an issue, so. Oh, totally. Okay. So basically um, it, it's an anti-skill and not a skill. Um, to, to not be able to ever say when you can't do something or to not be able to make realistic es estimations um, of what your boundaries and your abilities are. Yeah. It's interesting also, sorry. We... sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say um, one of the other uh, one of the other things here is that, um, and you'll probably be talking about this later, but there are times where you you can do something and times where you can't. Um, mm -hmm. And I found oh, that yes. even with my child, you know, people think if she could do something once in a certain s scenario mm -hmm. that she can always do it, but that's not always the case. So um, I can go on about I, that one for a very long time because <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're at, I think we're actually going to hit that a little bit later in this session. But but yeah, no, there's um, you know one one thing that I think a lot of non-autistic people don't know about autism is you know, and I I um, I wrote a post for We Are Like Your Child about it um, about what I kind of call extreme context dependence, mm -hmm. where factors that might be insignificant to um, neurotypical non-disabled people can can make a huge difference in whether mm -hmm. I can do something under one sort of cer set of circumstances, but not another. Yeah. There's also the related thing um, where if I'm not going to do something, people are going to like completely destroy themselves trying to figure out if it's a can't or a won't. And if it's a won't, yeah. they're like going to completely destroy themselves trying to manipulate me into doing it. And I say manipulate very intentionally. They are going to, this is not, you don't want to get in a power struggle with me, but able people can't learn that because they're really bad at, um, <laughs> at pattern recognition. I, that's, that could be its whole other webinar, but, um, and if it's a can't, they try to figure out how to change that. And maybe it's just a can't today, but um, allistic people are allowed to have won'ts and like we're not mm -hmm. and yeah. that's actually a really yeah. big deal as well um, which is possibly an adjacent webinar not this one but um, we're not allowed to say I can't and we're really not allowed to just say no I don't want to yeah. and if we try do um, say I don't want to then it turns into a uh, is this oh, why, why can't you Mm -hmm. Because and right. it, the I don't want to it becomes an I a it is treated as frequently as a can't and then you're and treated back into a you need to anyways. Right there, there's a really really fine line between not being allowed to say I can't and just not having any bodily autonomy or ability to refuse demands at all because people see mm -hmm. um, in a lot of contexts. Um, and I won't as, um, you know, lazy or antisocial or any number of things that just turn back into a different kind of obligation to do whatever somebody wants of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Cassiana, do you want to talk about the post that you had made about presuming competence? Um, yes. I mean, there's a lot of posts about presuming competence. Hi, Perkinji <laughs> okay. is going to say hi. Um, but um, I'm pretty sure you're talking about the one about 
believing me when I say I can't do something. Um, and that is part of presuming competence. Like, if you truly believe me, if you truly believe I'm a competent person, um, then you're going to believe me when I say, actually, I cannot do that. Or if I tell you, sometimes I can go to the grocery store. And this is an example of something that's very, sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. But today I cannot. You're not going to argue with me and say, well, yesterday you could go to the store. You're going to say, okay, you can't do that. If you don't think I'm a competent person, you're going to argue with me about it and bring up yesterday and last week because you're looking at other things and you're telling me, I don't think you're a good judge of what you yourself can do. And part of presuming competence is, you know, rather than saying you can do all these other things that are hard, oh, well, you can do this and this and this. So you can do this thing that I think is easy. Is it? Yeah. Um, (laughs) Sorry, I lost my flow. You know how it is. Uh, That's okay. Um, So because I do think this is a huge challenge for a lot of holistic Mm -hmm. people, especially people in the, in the helping fields, because um, I've written about those people too. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Okay. (laughs) You know, and, and I think, many of them also seem to feel pressure to like get certain things done or to meet Mm -hmm. certain goals. But, you know, I'm sure you can relate to the fact that that's not always possible in a Mm -hmm. small time frame. Um, You know, it's it's very variable. Well, is their goal, and I'm asking you this both actually asking you this, and I'm also asking those people who are watching this to consider this um write down their answer and then probably not send it to me um (laughs) is your goal actually to help me or is your goal to meet the goal short term on the paper and so that you can check it off and say we went to the store today which is your actual goal is your goal for me to go to the grocery store have food and actually be able to deal with that food or is your goal to say we went to the grocery store today and if we went to the grocery store that day i'm not going to be able to deal with that food but you can say, hey, we went to the store. Which is your actual goal? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an incredibly important question. And um, did you ever ask Cassiano which one was Cassiano's goal? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, well, clearly the paper that has the goals on it is far more important than what I want. <laughs> like, this is clearly the... Um, perspective Uh, a lot of folks come from. (laughs) I'd love to say one more thing about presumption of competence, because I feel like we talk a lot lot about what that means, and people, you know, always want to think that it means believing that a disabled or autistic person is is capable of anything, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people will push back on that, um, because obviously their children are significantly disabled, and, you know, many autistic adults continue to be as well. Um, and so we talk a lot about why that's not what it means. It, it means believing in every person's unique ability to, you know, learn and grow within our own environments. Um, but I think we also need to say that presuming competence might mean um, that an autistic or a disabled kid knows more than you about mm-hmm their specific Mm -hmm. situation or about their environment at a particular moment or their ability to deal with that environment at a particular moment. Um, Mm -hmm. It it can, it can really mean, um, you know, not, not just believing in somebody's endless potential capability, um, but having a little bit of humility yourself that, that they might really know something that you have no perception of whatsoever. Yeah. It mm-hmm. means believing that they know who they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, we that's what we expect in every other with every other group. Like Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. we, I would never want someone to presume that they knew better what I could do in that moment. So why mm-hmm. would it then be okay to do this to, you know, mm-hmm. disabled people or autistic people, especially children. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. part of, I think you all bring up a great point is saying I can't is a boundary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Boundaries are, are super important for everyone, but especially for people who might be more vulnerable 
because they're, you know, part of a marginalized group because our society is ableist and, you know, a variety Mm -hmm. of other things. So one of my favorite uh, children, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say that, you know, uh, on on the back of I you know saying I can't is a boundary saying I can't is is one way of saying no and we Mm -hmm. say a lot that self-advocacy starts with no yeah and one form of no is I can't Mm -hmm. yeah Kathiana you were going to talk about one of your favorite children yeah one of my favorite kids and I'm fortunate to know a lot of really cool kids because um I am um (laughs) will and this child gets called um oppositional or demand avoidant a lot but one of my favorite kids they will sit there and they will tell you exactly what they can do they will tell you exactly what they can't and they will tell you exactly what they need to expand the can you know the can a little bit further into the can't like if you want me to do this i need this they will sit there and they will tell you exactly that and this is such a gift yeah. that they are giving mm-hmm. you in spite of the pushback they get back and getting their adults to understand this, not so much the adults who live with them, but their other adults to understand that this is such a gift this child is giving them is, I'm sure there's a metaphor for it. Um, and w- pulling teeth, that's the one. And yeah. like, just this kid is so competent at specifically what it annoys people that they're competent at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they will sit there and they will draw those lines. And these are like these ironclad boundaries. And I love this kid so much. And I'm actually really impressed at the strength it takes to hold those lines. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. they're holding them against a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one one thing that we hear a lot from professionals increasingly is that um, something that autistic people might have trouble with, they think, is... Uh, something called interoception, which is our ability to perceive what's going on in our own bodies, um, to like assess our own feelings and interiority, um, you know, and just kind of like what's going on with us in any given moment. And I think that there are ways that that can really be true. And I think that there are also ways that we are actively taught not to pay attention to Mm -hmm. or understand our own bodies. Um, Mm -hmm. because, you know, we grow up largely with adults who don't have any firsthand understanding of how those things can be really different for us. And, and those, and those things can be inconvenient to, you know, us meeting whatever demand is on the table at the moment. And so there are just a lot of ways that I think, um, you know, it's not that we don't understand often. It's that we're, we're taught out of actually understanding ourselves in a lot of Mm -hmm. ways. Related to this. Um, I, something that I realized and wrote about recently was that I had been actively taught out of recognizing when I was in pain, Mm -hmm. because whenever I told people I was in pain and that I couldn't do things because I was in pain, people didn't believe me. And people just told me, Mm -hmm. oh, that's not a thing that could have injured you. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. You should be fine. And so Mm -hmm. I just started believing them because obviously and because so i just kept doing things anyways even although i was doing this on an injured body and so i stopped being able to recognize when i was in pain Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. at the and so i was like so how many p times are people talking about things like autistic people don't feel pain is this just that people are teaching people to not feel pain and there is that recent paper that came out where um they very obviously were intentionally triggering sensory pain. And yes, I'm using sensory oh, yeah. pain. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. They can come and, you know, be mad that I said pain instead of distress all they want. It was pain. And then they were taking away all the coping mechanisms that were reducing the pain. And apparently this was fine with an IRB because reasons. And then they're like, gosh, we don't know why autistic people don't have interoception. And it's like, really? Yeah. Really? You don't? Gosh. <laughs> I don't believe yeah. you, actually. Yeah. So do you feel like this is like a, a form of gaslighting? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's something that is grown up with so much because of every time you try to say that you can't do something, 
then you're told that you have to and that that reality isn't true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's, uh, there's a big debate about whether unintentional gaslighting is a thing, but there's a point beyond which I honestly don't know what else to call it if that is the effect over many, many years yeah. of being told that what mm-hmm. you're feeling isn't real, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and, you know, many people have been talking about this very subject. So doesn't there come a point where it's no longer unintentional that people aren't yes. listening? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say literally that. Yeah. Um, okay. So what about, um, could we talk about the relationship between autonomy and independence? Who would- we yeah. talked about it some here, but we can talk about it more mm-hmm. because we would mention, um, Emily mentioned that I can't just a way to say no. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, healthy adults actually need to be able to say when they can't do something. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I kind of want to throw in here a, um, you know, for for our audience that even just in the course of planning this webinar, literally every single one of us here had to, had to talk about multiple things that we could not do, whether Mm -hmm. like we couldn't, we couldn't do things, you know, we, we couldn't make certain days work or we couldn't do this while fighting vaccine side effects or or like, (laughs) you know, there were, there were 10 or a dozen different things that all of us had to say, like, I can do this, but I cannot do this in order even to like make this session come together. So like, like to, to be a healthy, autonomous adult who is maintaining a, you know, a balanced, sustainable existence um, and not running yourself ragged every day of your life, you have to be able to say when you can't do something. But that is bizarrely a skill that we don't allow children to learn. Mm-hmm. Part of and that. Don't teach, and don't teach children how to deploy. And then we kind mm-hmm. of wonder why kids grow up you know, and, and get burnt out, um, and get depressed and yeah. If you can't say no, your yes is meaningless. Yep. Mm -hmm. I would further like to point out for the people in the audience who are completely lacking in, um, pattern recognition, you have this population who is raised largely with intense compliance training. Um, I said what I said. And then, and taught they are not allowed to say no and told that their experiences aren't real. And then you are confused and horrified that we have an over 90% um, sexual assault and abuse rate. And um, you don't get to pretend you're confused by that. You, you, you don't get to. You have to put that outrage on the shelf until you have thought about why. If you can't um, say no in one situation, you don't know how to apply it in a different situation as well. Yeah. Like learning to say no is a skill. It's not something mm-hmm. that people just know when you're actively being taught not how to do it as a kid. And when you, and kids are at, not taught how to do this, they're taught how to not do this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're systemically stripped of our ability to say no, yeah. which makes mm-hmm. our yes pretty meaningless and there's yeah. some pretty intense learned helplessness that we have to systemically undo for ourselves as adults yeah mm-hmm. this all brings up such important points let me see if i can list them again and if i miss anything <laughs> please tell me so one is that the way that you are all treated as children clearly and very obviously has long-term effects that mm-hmm. are not necessarily good and in fact harmful, um, including learned helplessness, higher vulnerability to abuse. Um, um, you had another good one, Cassiana. Um, Did I? I don't well, remember what I said. I cannot <laughs> name five autistic people who I have met who do not have CPTSD. Having I can't met either. Thousand, yeah. probably easily a thousand. Wow. I'm trying to think. I don't think I can name two. The majority of research does not look at what happened to all of you. It's only only viewed as, you know, within the person. As Mel Baggs put it, 
um, professionals, I think it was Mel, it might have been Muskie, professionals don't like documenting their damage. Yeah. 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 I miss Mel. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and like I, I understand very much um, why parents and professionals are often really, really anxious to, um, you know, ensure that an autistic or a disabled kid will be as independent as possible, and have what they think of as the skills for independence. Because, you know, I'll be honest, there are definitely aspects of adult life that are easier the more things you can just do for yourself. That's right. true. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, a, a component of, of having control over your own life isn't just whether you can do things the most independently. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether you have autonomy, which is that um, you are fundamentally in control of making decisions about your life. And, um, you know, again, having an accurate estimation of your own abilities and being empowered to enforce your own decisions about what's mm -hmm. going on in your life is, um, you know, as, as critical a component of autonomy as anything like, can you do the dishes every day, for instance? Right. The number sometimes, of things that, sorry, go ahead. Sometimes we need to be able to ask other people for help which means we need to know when we need to ask for help because of what we can't do, but also be able to, as to say, I am in control of what help I am getting. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. even who you're getting it from or how you're getting that. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The number of things I have been able to refuse to do when I was told as a child I would need to do it, like, is completely astronomical. Um, oh, it's wild. Yeah. 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 I don't need to drive. Um, <laughs> it turns out you can, in fact, have pie for breakfast if that's what you want. There's all kinds of things. Um, I'm trying to think. There's some other things that are completely slipping my mind. I, you don't, I don't have need to, to fold laundry. There's no, no right. laundry folding police. It turns out you can say, no, I'm not doing that. Um, I can it's wear okay to not be out. able to go to the grocery store. To go back to that example, from what? It's fine. It turns out, um, yeah. And again, so these are also things that plenty of holistic people outsource. You know, yeah. we can get a laundry service, mm -hmm. we, we, Instacart. I mean, there's all sorts of services that the rest of the population seems to think are helpful, um, mm -hmm. and. Like, you know, I've talked about this with other people on before, but I think what you're getting to is the, A, the concept that, you know, the autonomy of being able to decide what's important to you, and then B, mm -hmm. the concept of interdependence. Disabled yeah. people are held to a much higher standard of independence to be allowed to say no. Yeah. Yeah. Things like, yeah. that other people just don't do and are just interdependent with, the, and are just expected to just do with other people, we are told instead, if you can't do this, then you need guardianship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Which... whereas you know, the, the, the number of non-disabled people I know who uh, not only can't cook, but are allowed to take pride in the fact that they can't cook. Right. Um, and, mm -hmm. and are never told that this is a reason why they have to live in an institution. Those are, those are actually, you know, whatever I, you or I or anybody else may think of those things, those are decisions that, that non-disabled adults are just routinely allowed to make about what they will and won't and can mm -hmm. and can't do. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah. Um, so, so you were all also talking about hard limits versus soft limits mm -hmm. so yeah basically so um you know roughly speaking like they're disabled people have more of them but i think everybody has some of them but like a hard limit is something that you just that you just absolutely can't do under any circumstances or without like an unreasonable amount of injury to yourself mm -hmm. um and then what i'm calling soft limits are things that may be circumstantial, 
um, that may change over time, um, that may be really, really context dependent. Um, sorry, I'm kind of looking at my notes right here. Um, the things that, that we know, can do in some situations and not in yeah. other situations, such as maybe you can do this today and mm -hmm. not other days. Maybe you can do this with these people and not these other people. Right. Maybe you can do this in the, like, if you, ha if the situation is correct, you can do them. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of these that we have for a lot of different reasons. Like, I can it, do your paperwork. I cannot do mine. <laughs> <laughs> I can, oh, clean, other, I can clean somebody else's house, but I cannot clean my own. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, again, another thing that I think a lot of non-autistic people like just don't have any idea of um, are uh, the ways that like we have to like rearrange and reapportion cognitive energy and cognitive mm -hmm. bandwidth. So, mm -hmm. you know, a soft limit might be something that like we can, um, you know, adjust the energy that we're using for other things. Um, so that that's something that we can do, but it does have an energy cost um, that might not be super apparent to people around us. Um, so one soft limit that I have is that I, I can speak sometimes. Mm -hmm. I can't always speak. This is sometimes that I just can't. Mm -hmm. It's also sometimes that I, it's just not good for me. And so this is just one of my soft limits is that sometimes I just can't use speech. Mm -hmm. And this is a really important limit for me to have. It is always also a really difficult limit to exist because it is such a thing that holistics just assume everyone can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or if um, you did it once, then you can do it always. Yeah. Yep. And I, I, um, this is a hard thing to phrase, but um, I, I think, you know, there are skills that can change. Do you want me to talk about that? I have time. some stuff about that. Um, yeah, actually, go ahead. <laughs> I can see Perkinji wants to a lot of changes uh, even before. Yes, Perkinji is. Yes. Things can and frequently do switch between hard limits and soft limits over time. It's not infrequent that kids grow into things they previously couldn't do as their bodies and minds change with age. Similarly, it is not infrequent that as children grow, they can't do things they previously couldn't. Growing up is hard and involves a lot of changes, even before disability is taken into account. When you do add disability, changing disabilities, and changing disability presentations, it is no wonder that there are a lot of changing limits. Don't get used to the moments when things are... Stop being confusing. But children also learn that soft limits won't be respected when they are pushed with statements like, you could do this yesterday, and why don't you just try? When I can't is not listened to, if that, I can't, is a soft limit, then one's response is to make it a hard limit. Yeah. It is easier to say, I can't, always then, I can't right now. People don't get used to the moments when things are possible and see those as default, and like they should always be true. So, children very well might end up turning soft limits into hard limits in order to avoid being badgered in the moments they cannot do things. Or they might end up turning soft limits into hard limits in order to avoid feeling pressured to perform when they can't do what is expected of them, because the expectation is to be capable of doing these any time and any place. The responses to the soft limit might simply be too much. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, soft limits and the the factors that make them possible or not possible can be really i mean literally complicated things to talk about and so when you've got you know autism is a disability that inherently has a, a language component um you know we let we learn language differently or slower right. than other people and so to combine that fact that we already have a communication disability 
with the fact that these are things that nobody teaches us to talk about. Um, you know, a kid could actually have an incredibly good intuitive understanding um, of what their limits are and when and why, but simply have no ability to phrase that to anybody else. And when their attempts to phrase that, you know, get used against them, then, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of being left with no choice, but to just make that a, you know, a simpler no than a more complicated mm -hmm. no. It's also, it's also a lot. Happened to... You go first. Um, it's a lot easier to develop a knee jerk no, mm -hmm. and then turn it into a yes after you've had time to process, than it is to say maybe and then try to turn that into a no. That's like how you get yeah the nope nope oh wait yes because if you say no occasionally there's people who will respect that, but people won't. People are really bad at respecting maybe, oops, turns out I can't. And that is true among adults with adults as well. But with kids, people are awful. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. let's, let's bring to the surface here what this is really about is that the, the people supporting the autistic person are missing cues and missing yeah. communication. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is not like this is not an autistic communication problem. This is a, you know, dyadic mm -hmm. interaction mm -hmm. where yeah. the neurotypical person is missing yeah. these cues. Yes. It also mm -hmm. matters in how we are teaching or how, how people are teaching autistic children communication um, and where they are like treating communi some communication as, as things that they will pay attention to and others won't. And I have some stuff on that too. There is a huge problem with teaching AAC where adults ignore all communication except a given AAC app, either purposefully or not. One response to this that sometimes happens is that children refuse to use that app because they can't use it for everything. It is necessary to pay attention to all communication and treat it all as communication for many reasons when you're discussing communication access. But one of the reasons is because of what occurs here with soft limits turning into hard limits. If you can't use this always and don't listen to unless you do what others expect, then why should you use it at all? You still aren't yeah. being listened to. So in terms of how we actually are listening, like what, how we're communicating at all isn't necessarily being listened to, not even if we are saying no. Yeah. Yeah, if you're demanding we say no in exactly the way you want to do it, you want us to do it that's still not respecting a no um right. why yeah. does my child flop on the ground well because you didn't listen to other ways <laughs> and this is the no you are hearing yeah. um yeah. like i i don't know why i need to explain this to you i really don't i i don't understand but um yeah but it, also why does my kid have meltdowns because that is the mm -hmm. no you listen you're to. not hearing yeah. it yeah if, like, if, I don't understand. A meltdown's a lot of energy. They're not gonna, they're not melting down for funsies. Um, yeah. If you listened to something less drastic, they wouldn't be as likely to do it. Mm. You know, that's a big energy expenditure. Um, yeah. And like, since we have Prakinji here, if I could make the analogy, you know, people actually, well, and I have a whole thing about how like, people seem to understand things when it comes to cats that they cannot understand when it comes to autistic children. But, mm -hmm. you know, we see people getting told a lot that like, if it seems like a cat just lashed out and attacked you for no reason, it wasn't for no reason. It was that you mm -hmm. missed earlier, subtler cues of distress or displeasure or whatever a cat wanted mm -hmm. you to stop doing. But mm -hmm. humans, you know, are raised to be bad at understanding cat language. Um, you know, and the 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 same thing is, um, you know, true for autistic people. We don't so much have communication impairments as I think we are speaking different dialects of physical yeah. language mm -hmm. in a lot of ways um, that, you know, and there are a lot of times that, um, you know, parents and teachers willingly um, overlook what they should see but mm -hmm. there are also a lot of ways mm -hmm. and again i have a whole other thing about this i think there are a lot of ways that parents actively get taught out of 
understanding their autistic mm-hmm. kids' communication. Yes, absolutely. We, uh, you know, I have experience with this. I'll just say very briefly that um, I felt that I got the message that I no longer knew how to parent my child yeah. when I realized she was autistic. Mm-hmm. It was like, nope, you're not, you can't do it anymore. You need this team of people who are going to tell mm-hmm. you how to act and what to do. And that's like a very scary and unsettling yeah. thing. And I've told this story before, but there was a time where my daughter was 20 months old, maybe, and was crying. And I would never, ever ignore that. I Mm -hmm. would always want to Mm -hmm. respond to her. But in that moment, I was told to ignore her and not to make eye contact. And it still haunts me to this day. One of the the most frequent things that I end up telling parents is that – their kid needs to be loved, their kid needs to be parented, and their kid doesn't need to be tra- to be therapi- therapized mm-hmm. by them. They just mm-hmm. don't need to do have any of these mm-hmm. fancy things. They don't need to be treated as anything. Just treat them like a child. Like mm-hmm. the all the most the literal most common thing that I tell people is your child is a child. Your child mm-hmm. is disabled, and this is true. But you don't need to get caught up in this. Your child is a child. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I tell, um, you know, when I was coaching gymnastics, sorry, go ahead. Um, oh, no. Or I guess I'll go. When I was coaching gymnastics, if I told parents, I was, they're paying me to be the coach. And when I'm working with autistic kids, I tell parents, they are paying someone else. If they're doing therapy, they're paying someone else to do therapy, which they should be looking at what they're doing. But they are mom or dad or other parent. That is their job. If their therapy team is asking them to be a therapist, then it is definitely too invasive of a therapy mm-hmm. and is definitely taking over their life and they need to run. Yeah. Or wheel yeah. or however they move, but they need to move as fast away as they can. And yeah. like we object to this kind of stuff and a lot of people like instinctively want to make it about, well, then do you just never teach kids to push their limits or do you never do you never teach kids to advance their skills? And no, you know, I, I, I very much think that it is the job of um, a good teacher or a good coach or a good therapist in some circumstances um, to teach kids to expand their boundaries. But again, part of that is, is also teaching them to expand their self-knowledge. And so you, mm-hmm. can't, you can't authentically expand boundaries in the long term by actively teaching kids not to use their own self-knowledge and not to expand their own self-knowledge. And just the reality is that autistic and disabled kids have, have different internal boundaries than other kids do. And there just might be times that like, you have to, you have to trust them to find that out. It is good to push limits, assuming you're pushing them correctly. But one of the limits you're pushing is learn about yourself so that you know when yeah. to say no and how to say yeah. no. Mm-hmm. Like, that is another place. thing. That, that is another direction to push. Yeah. They need a safe place to land. Mm-hmm. Um, if everybody mm-hmm. in their life is pushing them and telling them they can't say no, then they don't have a safe place to land. Yeah. They don't have anywhere to circle back to when it turns out the water was too deep. And mm-hmm. um, you don't want that. Or at least I'm assuming nobody wants that for their kid. Um, and I do have, in fact, a Cassiana doesn't know where her limits are story that may or may not be appropriate here. And it's one of those things that's like, wow, you're like, that's super cool. It's like, no, I don't think any of you understands how not cool that is. But OK, is this the appropriate place for that? Um, Could we edit it I out don't if know. it's not? Yeah, we I can guess, edit yeah. it if it's not. <laughs> I don't know. I know we <laughs> talked about that. So um you know, I was an autistic kid diagnosed in the 80s. I do not have interoception particularly, um, and I also did gymnastics, so even less interoception, though my coaches were actually very cool. Um, they didn't really learn to say no. A few years back, I was doing a presentation at UW. Um, I did a presentation um, called The Disabused Presumption of Benevolence. Um, the What the presentation actually was isn't important. The important part is I woke up with a headache that probably was hospital worthy. Um, (laughs) Went, gave my entire presentation 
as soon as it was over, could not stop throwing up because I had like a heroic measures migraine and gave this presentation because I had to do this presentation. That is what I was there for. And I don't, you know, I don't get to say no, right? They paid me to come up there. I've done this. I know, no, it's like, and people are like, wow, you did that. I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. It is, but like, no, I, it's probably not. But you know, I have you don't literally get to have done given presentations with migraines that should have had given had me in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was not ideal. But when you're not allowed to have limits, then you don't have mm-hmm. a good sense of maybe I can actually bow out of this one. I have a good reason. Yeah. So, and isn't yeah. the whole point of good limits too? I mean, doesn't it promote more trust? Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, if 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 you're a, a teacher or a therapist and you want kids to put themselves in very vulnerable situations with you, then you have to be trustworthy. Um, mm-hmm. And and that can take a lot of time uh, for kids who have mm-hmm. had their trust abused and. I mean, I think all kids really, but disabled kids especially, mm-hmm. are given a lot of reason to distrust adults. Yeah. And so, I, you Absolutely. know, it can take a lot more listening to know than you think it maybe should um, to become a trustworthy person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing I've noticed with my daughter is that there's times where, like, I'll ask her something, like, say, you know, do you want to take a bath? And like immediately her, I can tell her response is no, um, which by the way is not necessarily, she doesn't have verbal speech. So I'll just yeah. put that mm-hmm. out there because she's very clearly mm-hmm. saying no. Um, yeah. And so I'm like, okay, it's okay. We don't have to do it right now. If I ask her again, say a half hour later, sure, let's go. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just mm-hmm. because in that, like she needed time to maybe redirect what she was doing or, you know, adjust to the Mm -hmm. idea of going to take a bath. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I I think for a lot of parents, we feel this like pressure to, um, I mean, because society in general is about compliance and about, Mm -hmm. you know, doing what you were doing, what you're supposed to do and, and, and like making other people think that, you know, your, your kids are like well-behaved and stuff like that. I, we, that could be a whole other webinar, but um, anyway, my my point is that I've found personally that when I respect her communication and her boundaries, we have a much better relationship. She trusts me, like she knows that I'm not going to do anything that is going to like jeopardize her. Um, and again, just she doesn't have verbal speech, and yet mm-hmm. we can still have these interactions yep. where you know we're communicating a great deal people assume that what we say with speech is going to be a yes or a no and is the correct yes or no mm. and frequently we end up actually just saying yes because we feel like we have to because we've been told we mm-hmm. can't say i can't even if that isn't actually what we want to say Because we've Mm -hmm. spent so long saying, being told, you aren't allowed to say I can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's just a thing that happens because you have spent your entire life saying that's the only option. And Mm -hmm. even if you're in it, people also will only pay attention to that if in other communication methods you're saying no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I I think it's a really related issue that... um, you know, and autistic people my age and older frequently grew up undiagnosed. And yet, like, even if we weren't in formal therapy, people could tell that we were different. And people, mm-hmm. people absolutely could tell um, that, that we had, you know, different ability sets than other kids. So a lot of this still happened to us, even, even, even if it didn't happen in as formal ways or like in technical therapy. Um, but I, I think that there is really a connection between the ways in which younger uh, disabled and autistic kids get taught not to have boundaries and the fact that um, I- intensive life-ruining burnouts are such a thing um, among mm-hmm. autistic women particularly 
you know, in their 40s and 50s. And I like, yeah. I think there's a gendered component there too. I think that, um, you know, there are expectations of women in our society still to, mm -hmm. to be accommodating um, yeah. and, and to say yes. And so I think that, you know, it's a related problem that I hear, um, you know, so many middle-aged women got diagnosed because they had a complete burnout mm -hmm. um, and lost everything because they had been ignoring all of their own limits for so long. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wow. really common, yeah. really devastating story. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and I'm, I'm glad earlier you said that mm -hmm. autism is a disability. And this is something that I've gotten pushback on, even when I'm speaking to people about, mm -hmm. you know, learning from autistic adults. Um, and I know that we touched on this earlier, but I just think it's such an important point to go back to. The, the neurodiversity movement and, you know, the adult community, like all of you, I think it's so generous that you all share your experiences and are trying to help the next generation of, of families um, and trying also to help yourselves so that, you know, community services and just relationships so that we can all do better mm -hmm. to support you as adults. Um, but could you just talk a little more? Because I've gotten pushback when I've said, you know, if um, people are making decisions about autistic people or, you know, people who are working with autistic people who don't know adults, like you were saying before. The pushback has been, well, some people have much more significant disabilities. So those adults can't speak for their kids. Oh, I would so like to take <laughs> this one, please. Good, take it. <laughs> Everybody's going to sit down and be afraid. Um, so I've actually been in this movement for um since i was 16 because when i was 16 i didn't have a good long-term um understanding of what it was like to be autistic on the internet and with my very uncommon name attached um yeah. so i've been hearing that stuff a really long time and the thing is if somebody wants to say that because i can argue with them on the internet i am not disabled they are welcome to come and be my free pca for a week and then tell me i'm not disabled they are absolutely welcome to do that they can send me an email and we'll set that up. Um, the adults on the internet who are telling them things they don't want to hear, we are not trying to criticize them to make them sad. We don't want their kids to have the same struggles we have. Yep. I mean, we're going to have similar neurologies. We are going to have similar inbuilt, inbuilt impairments. Like we are going to have some overlap. Um, we're not all gonna be the same because uh, different autistic people have different constellations of impairments and strengths and that's fine. But we're not angry until, you know, y'all talk to us like that. We are scared for your kid, okay? Yeah. Because we keep seeing the patterns. We see the patterns, and it's just the same thing over and over and over. And those of us who are in our 30s or those who are older than us, we have seen this over and over and over. I've seen, you know, 22 years of this, and it's the same thing over and over. I don't want to see your kid go through it I didn't want to see the kids who are 20 now going through it I don't want to see the kids who are 30 now which isn't that much younger than me go through it it's fixable and yeah we're disabled mm -hmm. so I can argue with you on the internet that doesn't mean I can do much yeah. of anything else I'm I can't do my dishes regularly etc these are disparate skill sets I mean I can mm -hmm. do a backflip I'm gonna assume you cannot this might be unfair no. but I'm also <laughs> going to assume that you can like make dinner on a regular basis no. which again might be unfair <laughs> these are different skill sets these are vastly different skill sets like we're not yeah. we we want we're on your kid's side we hope that's the side you're on as well um we like to think that's the side you're on as well that's probably the side you're on as well we are on your kid's side and that sometimes it hurts to think that your kids saw maybe it hurts I, i'm assuming it hurts to be like oh we have very different ideas of what that looks like but we're not it, we're being read wrong a lot i think and then the defensiveness ends up being attacking us which is not yeah. great 
yeah, I think we it's want against it's not you. Directed we right. don't want your kids to grow up with the trauma we had, and that mm-hmm. is something that is avoidable. It is, but it is something that people that need to realize is a problem in the first place before, in order to avoid it. Yeah, I look forward to a world where breaking us isn't inevitable. Yeah, yeah, because right now it is. And that's not the world I want to live in. I want to, before, you know, I die, I want there to be a world in which breaking autistic kids isn't inevitable. Yeah. And if that so, sounds really depressing, it kind of should. Um. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I completely agree. And I feel that weight myself, even as a non-disabled person, because I want better for all of you too. And, you know... It, it there's times where I feel like it's going to take so much, but I think mm-hmm. doing, I think having conversations like this is absolutely part of making these shifts and you mm-hmm. know allowing our mm-hmm. allowing ourselves as the holistic community to maybe be a little uncomfortable at times and question what we've been told and what you know mm-hmm. what we've been doing. Um, because like you said, again, it's, this is all trying to help this next generation. Mm. Um, so maybe, so I had something else to add where people will say to autistic adults that, you know, you're not like my child because you, and they frequently end up saying things that every example they give, I know people who don't, who can't do those things. Literally Mm -hmm. every example. I know people who are online and can't do those things. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's not that we can, that we, it's not even that we can do these things. I know people who can't type and are posting online. Like we, we, we can't necessarily do things like make our own food or speak or live independently or work. Like, these own things that we're not people who just can do everything. It's that we know what we can do and what we can't do. And what, and we have figured mm-hmm. out ways to make it so that we can do what we want and what we can do mm-hmm. in order by having, by having ways to compensate for what we can't. I can't well, make then decisions. I say, then I okay, will, while okay. you're decisioning, I will say the other thing on the um, point of maybe breaking us isn't inevitable. Um, <laughs> Which is that sometimes engaging with the parents who aren't ready to hear that is like a way more effective form of hurting ourselves than hitting our heads on walls as it was. (laughs) And um, I know it's funny and it's not funny. And like, that's how much we want better for your kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, but also that's in the category of things to meditate upon. Kind of like, do you want to help us or do you want to follow the plan? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. is, is this yeah. really the choice you want to be making in your so, interactions? So I will sometimes put more time than I ever put into things that are paid into un into things that are unpaid entirely because I am seeing kids there that are hurting in ways that I see are so easy to fix. Mm-hmm. In the pay, when I was doing paid work, I could, it, these were all fixable, but it was hard to fix. Like I was, and I could do things to make small changes, but it was, they, but it was, they, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to fix the problem. But now it's these things where it's, if you just listen to this one thing, you can make major changes to your kid's life. May, if I just spend five more minutes, I might be able to completely change the course of this kid's life. And this will happen for a good 10 hours someday. And then I won't be able to, you know, do anything else. And I will spend the rest of the day sobbing because I burnt myself mm-hmm. out. But that's worth it to me, even though I hurt myself that badly. Because what if I saved one more kid? We aren't allowed to yeah. say I can't, and sometimes it manifests that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the limit? Yeah. I don't know. 
I don't, it was both, this is both a, I don't have the ability to say I can't and I don't have a limit. And this is a way that is, I, we just care that badly mm -hmm. to make it so that maybe someone else can say I can't, even though I can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm, I want to jump ahead just a little bit to the relationship between being able to say I can't and um, the idea of disability acceptance. And there's this weird way in which a lot of people both want their child's autism to be considered a disability and don't actually want to treat it like a disability, on the other hand. Um, you know, again, and it, it, I think it comes from the fact that just most non-disabled people don't understand a lot about the mechanics of disability. Um, they're afraid. They, mm. Yeah, they're, they're afraid. And, and they're also given like not a lot of chances a lot of time to understand like what that really means. But, you know, for something to be a disability, and we could argue all day about the medical model versus the social model of disability or, you know, the social relational model of disability or whatever. But Alternatively, we could day, not. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, at, you know, at the end of the day, that something is a disability means that we really do have um, a differently limited set of capabilities than non-disabled people have. Um, you know, and, and letting, letting kids admit to what they sometimes truly cannot do um, sets them up to being able to accept themselves as disabled people. And I, I think that, you know, people just have a really ambivalent relationship with um, their children being able to do that because they have a, an ambivalent relationship with that idea themselves. Yeah. And this is also connected to what is this, the relationship between disabled children and disabled adults because frequently disabled children just never get a chance to meet disabled adults at least not yeah. disabled mm -hmm. adults with their same disability yeah um i mm -hmm. know for many of the autistic children who i have met and i've met a lot of them i mm -hmm. um don't know how many different schools I worked in where I was the only autistic person who ever worked in those schools and um, they had never met anyone outside of school either. Um, I would I was the first person that these autistic kids had ever met for most of these people. Um, mm -hmm. And they just so people never get that chance and then which means that you have a lot of disabled children who are getting taught that nobody else, no adults can't do mm -hmm. the types of things that they can't do. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. this idea of not yet has to be a not yet because there's no adults who can't do that. They don't exist. Autism I is firmly, yeah. I firmly believe that every parent of autistic kids needs autistic friends. And if you are incapable of making friends with autistic adults, like not going and hiring an autistic adult, but making friends with autistic adults, it's time for some meditation. Um, <laughs> your kid needs to see people, your kid, and I wrote about this actually in Sincerely Your Autistic Child. It was part of my mm -hmm. thing. Your child needs to see adults who they can imagine being like when they grow up. Mm -hmm. Every kid needs to see role models. Um, and that for your autistic kid, may include autistic adults and i think actually that all kids need to see their adults being friends with disabled people of various kinds but your autistic kid mm -hmm. especially needs to see that their parents choosing to hang out with people whose brains are like theirs like that's it vitally important. For many reasons, yeah. but one of this is this whole because other people need to be able to they need to be knowing other people who can't do similar things and yeah. I like I have so many stories of people who just they didn't believe that they were allowed to not be able to do things, and this was causing them to hate themselves so like so deeply because of the fact that they knew that was wrong that they couldn't do that, mm -hmm. and it took knowing that maybe there was another way to do something by seeing someone doing something else 
to maybe start finding a way to maybe hate themselves slightly less. Yeah. Uh, it's something and, that Steph reminded me also that Mel Bags had written about, and she wrote about it um, in, in her chapter for Sincerely, Your Autistic Child, but she also wrote a lot of blog posts that touched on this, um, that you, if you don't see adults who cannot do the things that you cannot do, then, um, and I hear that I hear this a lot from um, autistic people who thought that they just died when they were 30 mm -hmm. because they they had no concept of adulthood um, oh my God. in which they could not mm -hmm. do the things they could not do. Yeah. When I wow. was like 19, yeah. I saw a thing going around that was about like autism, the middle years, 18 to 21. And I was like, really? Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'm middle-aged. Please mm -hmm. know, and this is not actually important. When I was 19, I easily passed for 12. So, like, this was deeply funny, but also, <laughs> yes, middle-aged, 21. Yeah. yeah. When yeah. I started do, being involved with autistic stuff online when I was 13, I didn't know anyone older than 18 online, mm -hmm. even. Wow. Yeah. So it's, you it's think just really hard to understand your own future um, mm -hmm. yeah. if you can't see adults who cannot do things you might actually never be able to do. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and it's like, I know that it's a rough thing because, um, you know, so one thing that can happen for autistic people is uh, waking up one day suddenly in possession of complex skills we never had before. That, right. That's the that's thing that can really happen. Um, it's uh, weird it's weird every time it's weird and it's fun um and you know I got in a Have lot of fights had that happen? oh yeah mm -hmm. and I got in a lot of fights with parents about this being a thing before I realized this was not so much a thing it's, uh, it's just something I assumed it happened to everyone yeah um but the converse is um, that you you also like you have to accept that level of possibility um, side by side with the real possibility that there are things your child might actually never, ever be able to do. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I get that the uncertainty is hard, but I and think at the that... same time into that I've waken up, woken up and not been able to speak yeah. for two weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's just a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, this is again though why hearing directly from you, like we need it because I even remember when she was young, when I first found autistic adults online, I was like, wow, I didn't even know, <laughs> like you said, I didn't know you existed mm -hmm. either. And then you see this like plethora of wisdom and experience. And I know for me that it helped me like calm down because. I was like, okay, you know, they grow up to be adults. Like, yes, you know, they still have disabilities, but like most of them are, you know, okay. And I know that that's like a relative term because many of you have you know, totally. burnout and, and things, you know, because of what happened to you. And so I don't want to like minimize it at all, but I'm just saying that like, because again, that, that early intervention model is drilled into the parents when we find out that our child is autistic. So seeing you as adults is huge. And I, and I mean, in schools and therapists, like I don't really think many of, most of them have exposure to adults either. So it's like no one has exposure to autistic adults, but we're all kind of making decisions and trying to do things. I am quite so, little so, about saying that I'm the only autistic person who worked in any one of the either spe specialized schools or autism programs that I worked in because of the fact that other people didn't put themselves through that trauma. Yeah. <laughs> because so it is honestly, at, trauma yeah. to work mm -hmm. in those places. At this point in the world or in this country, in the year 2021, if somebody who grew up in the United States 
has not and chooses to work with autistic people has not met autistic adults has not interacted in some way with autistic adults has not read our writing that is a choice that they have chosen to make it is very very easy to google writing by autistic adults and get a whole lot it is a choice they are making it is not hard to find us it has not been hard to yeah. find us for a really long time i found us um when i was 16 and that was 1999 so is that I, right? I found the yeah. I found stuff in 2002 online. Yeah. Autistics.org 1999 um, was my first exposure. Um, dial up internet, represent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we might want to talk about um, do you, some of the things that, you know, when a kid reflexively says i can't i think that that can mean a lot of different things and i think it mm -hmm. can be useful for um you know parents and teachers to know what some of those are so that they can start mm -hmm. to ask different questions um but so um i think i think a lot of adults honest to god don't remember what it is like to be children um, and forget that sometimes the reason that we can't do something is literally because nobody has ever shown us how, or literally mm -hmm. nobody has ever taught us how. Um, and so I would say that's starting point number one. If a child says that they can't do something, find out literally if anybody has ever taught them or shown them at all. Well, maybe they've um, been shown, but they don't remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, and or it, maybe you literally showed them once mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah um it might mean they need to be shown differently um mm -hmm. uh, this is a term that Cassiana taught me it might mean that they need scaffolding that they need some kind mm -hmm. of like base structure there for them to figure out how to build on um it could it could mean um that they're having trouble and they don't know how to explain it to you um because again uh you know, non-disabled society is really bad at teaching disabled kids uh, language for our own circumstances. Yeah. Um, it could mean that uh, they find it embarrassing to do in front of other people um, or that they are afraid they're going to be embarrassed if they try in front of other people and fail. Um, it could be that they're afraid of disappointing you. Um, mm. It could be that they do know how to tell you, but they're just afraid of not being believed. Um, and I think this is going to, related um, to being afraid of being, not being believed is the, I, is some of the, I technically could do these, like I could technically do this, but it costs too much. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I could do this, but I cost too much. And now you're not, oh, you're going to believe me that it costs too mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this is going to transition well into, um, how, we want to talk about uh, the label of pathological demand avoidance. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it, it yeah, could also it, say, like, can, uh, transition well into assistive tech. Yeah. Um, um, I really want to address specifically errorless prompting. Yeah, that is um, one either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, because it could also mean I may or may not be able to do it, but last time I tried to do a thing and wasn't sure I could do it, y'all yanked it out of my hands or even worse, grabbed my hands and did it for me with my hands, which is errorless prompting. And somebody is now going to be in your comments telling me that's not what errorless prompting is. They are wrong. They are being untruthful. Errorless prompting is very much as soon as you start doing the thing, not the way I want you to do it. I'm going to take over either with your body or with mine. And, you know, that's really traumatic. Um, yeah. Kids need to learn through mistakes. Everybody yeah. learns through mistakes. Have any of you learned things consistently by never making a mistake? Because I have not. And I've done things mm -hmm. where making mistakes could actually be pretty devastating. Um, and those are actually the things I've had the most fun doing and where learning was the least traumatic. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so I can't means you. I'm afraid you are going to take it out of my hands and do it for me sometimes, mm -hmm. or somebody has already done that. Um, and I'm so afraid of making a mistake. I can no longer do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that leads to the learned helplessness too. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. When you don't get to make a mistake, then any risk whatsoever is terrifying. Mm -hmm. 
And being afraid and of making a mistake could either be because could be because of the, this physically, or it could be because of how you are treated when you're when you mm-hmm. make a mistake. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a thing where um, kids, I mean, and adults can can um, become untrusting when if you meet one demand there's you're only rewarded with another demand and Mm -hmm. you don't know if you succeed at the first demand whether demands simply continue to escalate Mm -hmm. to the absolute limit of your abilities Mm -hmm. um you know i can't i can't can can mean I, i don't i don't necessarily trust you or this situation or what comes next because i don't know if the fact that I succeed at this means that demands just escalate forever. Right. Mm-hmm. So it could be like five steps ahead, you know, yeah. they're thinking I'm Absolutely. not going to do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or if I can do it once and it's really expensive, like Steph said, are you going right. to be asking me to do it every day or over and over for the rest of my life? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mm because being able to do it once in like a surge of get it done doesn't mean you can do it forever, which is actually a thing that disability paperwork has a real hard time with or getting services. Can you wash the dishes? Technically, yes. Can you make food? I can make a grilled cheese. Technically, yes. Can you, you know, technically, yes. In this, (laughs) if all of these four things line up, then I can do this and have a fifty percent chance of it li- of it succeeding. All mm-hmm. of these things. Okay, that means every- that that means forever. Right, every time. Absolutely not. Yeah. All the things. No, no, I cannot. <laughs> um. And I know I had this in the notes, but that ac- that actually uh, relates well to. There was this great. Tumblr conversation and somebody who was not autistic but had ADHD asked if anybody else went through this thing when they were kids where they learned how to do something um, basically in a burst of adrenaline. Um, mm-hmm. And so they established the fact that that technically speaking they could do the thing but forever after you know like learned that they could do this thing basically by provoking an adrenaline response in themselves and that was the that became the only circumstance under which they could do that thing you know and um i felt uh, personally I, attacked yeah. by that post <laughs> yep and, <Same. laughs> and i was involved in the you know a lot of other autistic and adhd people got involved to say like yeah this is absolutely a dynamic that in order to avoid some kind of embarrassment or punishment in the moment uh, you know, you use an adrenaline burst to accomplish yeah. something really, really difficult. And the first problem is that it leads people to believe that you can do that all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, 1B, to not understand the kind of like internal cost that that cost you. Uh, but two, that it, it, it actually means that you don't develop the practice skills or the study skills or the anxiety management skills Mm -hmm. to, to do things sustainably and to do things confidently. um, When you you always are using an adrenaline rush because that's the only way you learned it. Mm -hmm. You'd never get a chance to learn it any other way. Yeah. Yeah. What is executive function? There is no executive (laughs) function, only adrenaline. Yeah. There was adrenaline and asking other people mm-hmm. for help. <laughs> you know, and so really it's like, yes, you can, you can get a kid to respond this way. Uh, and I will also say as an adult who has gotten through some things, you know, riding an adrenaline rush, I'm not going to say that it is never the thing to do. Um, sometimes it is the thing to do that will get you through uh, that moment. But to teach kids to function this way um, is to give the adults in their lives a short-term reward at a real long-term cost for the child of Mm -hmm. learning how to do things in a way that might be a whole lot slower, uh, but will be a whole lot more secure in the long run. There's Mm -hmm. a difference between a kid getting through something that has to be done once in this way and a kid learning, this is how Mm -hmm. I do everything. Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. this is how I learn how to 
get through a homework assignment and this is how I get through a school day and this is how I get through a conversation mm -hmm. and this is how I get through mm -hmm. a meal and this is how I get through every last part of my life. Yeah, if somebody says to you, oh, I'm going to, instead of supporting my child in ways that are difficult for me and inconvenient for me, I'm going to teach them to effectively harness panic attacks. You're going to be like, you're going to what now, right? Yeah. But that is effectively, I think, how we were all taught to do things. And mm -hmm. I'm sure it wasn't exactly on purpose, but it's yeah. still what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. also what happened to other, other two kids now. Like, this yes, is not something is. that just used to happen mm -mm. 30 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever. This is happening now. And this is happening to kids now because people yes. either don't know how to do differently or haven't bothered looking into something else or don't care to look into something else mm -hmm. depending mm -hmm. on the situation or in the, many cases with parents are actively taught to do this mm -hmm. rather than something else because other people are saying oh you should do this type of thing this is how you should parent yeah. so any type of other type of parenting they might do turns into this and the panic will get you past the I can't but at what cost yeah. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, do you That's want a panic mm -hmm. disorder? I would, I mean, how do I uninstall it? You know, yeah. as the internet asks, I, I would rather put it back. Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, I don't know autistic people. I mean, I might know one or two, but definitely not more than two. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, maybe three even, but I don't think so who don't have PTSD. And this is because of this type of thing of that's just how you do everything is you have to do this in order to manage every last thing, mm -hmm. as well as learned helplessness and every last other part of this is just that's you're told you can't that you can't say i can't you're told you need to use adrenaline rushes you are told that this is all of what you do yeah no um i would like to talk about um the relationship i think this has to um the the rising popularity i see of a label called pda Mm -hmm. um, which stands for pathological demand mm -hmm. avoidance. And there's an older one too called ODD or oppositional oh, yeah. defiant disorder. I had that one for a while. Yeah. Which, you <laughs> Surprising know, uh, no one. <laughs> which, yeah, yeah there's, and there are things that I'm skeptical of in similar ways. Um, but so I'm seeing yeah. this huge rise in the popularity of uh, the label PDA. And I have, I've, I've seen parents saying that their autistic kids fit the PDA profile, and I've even seen autistic mm -hmm. people themselves like identifying with this profile. Uh, that hurts baffles, me. It hurts me, and it baffles me a little bit, but uh, not entirely, because again, I think a lot of the things that it springs from are just not having um, better language to describe what you are really going through. And the fact mm -hmm. that so many of us have been taught have been taught not to know ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, um, you know, that uh, this is something that I cannot prove, but something that I think um, would benefit from intense study and very quickly. Um, I think there is a relationship between kids being taught that they are not allowed to say they can't and being labeled with pathological demand mm -hmm. avoidance which suggests that they're refusing reasonable demands just pathologically for absolutely no reason mm -hmm. and that this is a profile of autism um, a couple kids i know yeah. sorry go yeah. ahead or no um, um okay and um you know so it again going going back to the the facebook post that started all this um somebody actually commented there but it's a thing that i have seen teachers comment multiple times in other places that they actually teach kids in their classrooms not to say I can't, but to say things like, um, I don't want to, or I decided not to. 
Um, and that is really explicitly setting kids up to be required to show adversarial behavior in order to set a boundary or in order yeah. to tell you mm -hmm. anything about mm -hmm. their abilities. Um, if, if they're given no option but to show adversarial behavior, you know, that is mm -hmm. what you have left them with. And I think it's intensely mm -hmm. problematic, A, to then paint that as some kind of inherent aspect of autism. A, when what you're, what, what it's actually doing is obscuring things that we actually do know about autism. Um, right. And again, this is a case where I'm going to know, uh, I, I know that I'm preaching to a choir a little bit, but, um, you know, we increasingly know that autism may inherently involve um, challenges with movement and motor planning. Mm -hmm. um, and so it becomes super problematic to me to ascribe a motivational or a moral aspect um, to what may be inherently a movement related disability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Frequently, uh, yeah. when I'm seeing people talk about mm -hmm. their kids having a PDA profile, they're saying, well, they had, this had to have been for this, and it couldn't have been a thing that was because of they, they, that um, they can't do things. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't look into the fact that what we can't do isn't what uh, holistic people can't do. Mm -hmm. Like, so I just can't reliably pick up a cup and have mm -hmm, it yeah. come in with my hand, that's not something I can reliably do. I can sometimes do it. I can't always. Yeah. I the can't kids... reliably know what, like, what, how my body moves. Why are you assuming that this is what children can, can do? And if you're assuming that, then that's going to mean that they have to say that they can't in some way. Mm -hmm. The kids I know who are labeled PDA are pretty consistently the kids who um, want people to like them, mm -hmm. even if they don't quite know how to make that work. They are very caring. And a lot of autistic people are very caring, um, but they're like caring in a way that even people who are not good at seeing caring in a way that they don't perform it will notice. Mm -hmm. They're very invested in being liked and they are very invested in being understood. So they're the kids who will sit there and say, I cannot do this unless this, but I will do this. So it's like they're getting this label for spelling out what they can and cannot do. And it's like, okay, so you're telling me this kid is oppositional or is pathologically demanding or avoiding a demand when what this kid is doing is giving you this beautiful gift of on a platter telling you what they need. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. there's a problem here. And it is not the kid, mm -hmm, but yeah. they're the one who has the IEP. So you're the, they're the one who you're saying the problem sits with and they are, you know, yeah. they're a perfect baby angel. And we're going to need to talk about this in another way. Mm -hmm. And again, there, uh, there's research just recently out on this uh, that found that um, the PDA label is disproportionately being given to girls. And that surprised mm -hmm. me not at all. Not um, even. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, Jen. I'll try to find that link and send okay, it to yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, they're they're actually starting to find that girls are disproportionately diagnosed with PDA, um, or a PDA profile of autism. Um, and again, I just think there is a whole lot of social bias involved in that. Yeah. That girls are expected to accept being trained to mm. be to be compliant and to be. Uh, accommodating um, right. and when they are not people don't know how to deal the that much other is my experience mm -hmm. the other thing that PDA um, has a lot um, that um, people talk about a, a lot with it is the anxiety of mm -hmm. I can't do this because I'm anxious yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but that also comes will make is strongly associated with will of you're going to be anxious when you can't, haven't been able to say you can't in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's also a so, perfectionism. Yeah. Component. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And um, the other thing I was thinking is that um, I'm reading the book by Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah right now on what happened to you. 
and he's a neuroscientist and he drew a direct um connection between ODD and mm-hmm. trauma like a oh, trauma yeah. response mm-hmm. every mm-hmm. person i know who's been labeled ODD it has been traumatized same yeah mm-hmm. yeah well, you learn to say no right away because no is easier to change to a yes than yes is to mm-hmm. turn into a no. Yeah. And, and if you say it aggressively enough, people will back off. <laughs> it's not yeah. rocket surgery. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. But they, they give that one to kids who have boundaries that are inconvenient all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really what it is. It's this kid has boundaries and I don't like them. Yeah. And again, this is why, I mean, there's plenty of research available now to show that there are nervous system differences. And so Mm -hmm. I think so many people get caught up in like the behavioral paradigm and, you know, the instructional control and all of those Mm -hmm. things. And so, you know, adults, whether unwilling, whether it's within their awareness or not, are kind of creating situations that include high stress and low power Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that never leads to good outcomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just to go back to what you were saying about the whole early intervention model, which needs familiarity with autistic adults, but at this point, it also just needs familiarity with current science, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. a lot of which is finding that our nervous systems will do the same things that non-autistic people's nervous systems do just over hugely, hugely different amounts of time. Yeah. Um, That we just really have really, really different uh, developmental trajectories. Uh, And the, you know, the ages at which um, something might come naturally to us uh, can just be immensely different from what they expect of a non-disabled child. We also it's have much more sort of varied developmental yeah. trajectories. Because, mm-hmm. like, yeah. as I recall, Emily and I had fairly similar developmental trajectories, but yeah. I might be full of it. I know that we ended up in fairly similar profiles, but. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cassiana and I have been walking down the street together and literally, like, raised our hands <laughs> to shield our ears at the exact same moment, at the exact <laughs> same sound. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> like, even though in some yes. ways, like, we had really different childhoods. Um, you know, and in uh-huh. some in some ways we are not neurologically similar, and yet like at all uh, have wound up with both different ability sets, um, mm-hmm. but a lot of like wildly same perceptions. It's kind yeah. of amazing. Yeah. Like yeah. we have very similar <laughs> sensory profiles, and then like I'm captain coordinated <laughs> over here, <laughs> and I think Emily I'm might captain actually not. know what's from right. <laughs> And I'm like, what's left and right? Those are lies. Uh, I knew. And then I went into theater and then they were lies again. <laughs> that, that tracks. Yeah. <laughs> Saying I can't is important and a good thing. It is also sometimes what is necessary to figure out what can be done. When everyone has thought, for whatever reason, that one way is the way to approach how to do something then it is understandable that nobody would have thought to explore other alternatives. But there are always other alternatives, and I can't, can be the way to lead into these. When someone says they can't do something, one of the questions is what is the goal in the first place? What is it that needs, or wants, to be done, and has the correct question been being asked? What is it that the actual goal is? Because there is a difference between how you do it and what is being completed. And if someone is saying they can't do something this way, then that difference is real important. If this is the only possible way that is being presented, then it is the same as saying I can't in general, but exploring other possible ways can be how necessary adaptations, whether accommodations or assistive technology are found. Sometimes, the answer might always be I can't, and how to complete this goal is to have someone else do this. This is fine. We all have things we cannot do. Other times, finding other ways to do things is now possible, because of knowing of the option to look for different ways than are currently expected or requested. 
Maybe someone is saying I can't write, but they can dictate ideas and have someone else write them down, or potentially they can dictate to a computer. What the goal is here isn't the act of writing, and dictation works just as well if that is identified as a possibility. Similarly, I can't might mean I can't do one part of this, and rather than going larger, we can look at the steps involved. There are many moving pieces to completing things, and this is difficult, and a lot to ask of all children, not to mention disabled children specifically, sometimes they just can't manage all of the pieces. Looking at each piece and how they fit together, rather than looking at the whole, gives ways to adapt what parts can't be done by removing them, or otherwise, if specific parts can be identified. For example, if someone can't do their math homework, potentially, allowing use of a calculator for the arithmetic, while they focus on identifying what steps need to be done, might be approachable. And neither of these examples will work for everyone. The illustrative of an idea that potentially saying can't might be the door that opens to finding assistive tech and accommodations. Yeah. So exactly. uh, really frequently people end up stuck in this idea of this can't be done and don't think about how else it can be done. Yeah. And sometimes you can use I can't do this to think about, well, how else can I do it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I wrote down what you said about um, there being a lot of moving pieces to things because uh, you know, something I have a hard time getting people to understand is that there are immensely complicated things I can do when there are immensely simple things that I cannot do. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that can be because in a very complex process, there can be multiple paths to the same goal. And so if there is, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a single point step of that task that I can't do, I can go around it in effect and find mm -hmm. a different way. Yes. Yeah. But if it is if it is one simple thing that you're asking me to do that I can't do, there's yep. no way around. That's just the thing I can't do. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. They always call us inflexible. Yeah. And <laughs> we're so not. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. do it feels it like today. Other people get stuck in, you do it this way. And mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I do it some way, probably. Mm -hmm. But that might end up being, well, it needs to get done, so I pay someone to do it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Like, yeah, um, we're, uh, we allistics are certainly set in a lot of our ways. And I mean, I know even for me, like, venturing into this new world of like assistive technology i never even was aware of all of the possibilities that exist and yeah. it's pretty it's pretty extensive and but most people i know don't really know much about assistive technology either mm -hmm. and so i mean i'm definitely trying to bring it into more people's awareness but um when i was writing this up the other day I ended up in a conversation being like, so how many different pieces of assistive tech am I currently using? And I was like, I think it's only seven that are marketed as assistive tech that I was yeah. currently using in that moment, plus mm -hmm. things that weren't marketed as such. Right. Because that's just something that other people might not, like mm -hmm. non-disabled people don't necessarily think mm -hmm. of. And I'm just, and disabled people are just like, well, yeah, I just need something to do it in some slightly different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, even, how you know, many households? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, you know, I don't even use anything that is marketed as assistive tech. Uh, but I was sitting at work one night about to run a show and uh, literally like counted up the number of different forms of communication I had sitting in front of me. And it was like seven. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, yeah. You know, and so like a lot of it is just whether the tools that you have are working for you. Yeah. Uh, and there might be a different tool. Don't ask me how to, to count and, up how many methods yeah. of communication. <laughs> That's not going to be a thing that I can do within the yeah. time we have left. Yeah. 
It's just thinking how many like households of allegedly entirely neurotypical people, especially, you know, like our ages have group um, text messages for their households. Yes. Which is absolutely an accommodation I need, like Mm -hmm. as a person who lives in a house with more than just me or, well, okay, it's an apartment. (laughs) Like that's an accommodation I need. And no, I can't always do real time communication is Mm -hmm face-to-face especially is the kind of thing that would get absolutely pathologized but how many people literally my age that's just how their mm-hmm. households have communication right um yeah. the group text message is very much a thing yeah like how many things that are literally sometimes marketed as assistive tech are also just sometimes marketed as how many people wear smart watches yeah mm. mm-hmm. exactly yep like I use my, I, when I was counting up things, I also realized I can't count my smartwatch as assistive to as something that is marketed as assistive tech, even though I specifically bought it as such, because mm-hmm. it's just not anymore. Mm-hmm. Even, even how, like, I use tons of emojis. I love GIFs. Like, that's AAC, really. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, so I've done some, I, some presentations for AAC in the cloud that was specifically about what types of things about non-conventional AAC. One of them I was doing did was about not unconventional AAC. Well, a lot of what it was talking about was also things that just everyone does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it was specifically talking about it in the form of, well, people can also do this for AAC, but it was for the purpose of, of talking and not for the purpose of saying, and everyone does this. But it was also saying for the purpose, yeah, everyone just uses this. Right. And that point was made because a lot of, there were things that like, um, there were things that were originally made for deaf people and now just everyone uses them. Like, Mm -hmm. I think text messages were originally made for deaf people. And yeah. Yeah. Um, Even captioning. I use captioning on every show I watch. Mm -hmm. I love Um, captioning. Captioning is necessary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yep. So there are things that are, are no longer thought of as assistive tech. And there's also things that might be thought of as, like, that are important and think of, and think of as assistive tech. And you need to realize it's an option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, there is both you, you everyone, the things everyone uses or everyone has available. And there's the things you need to go out of your way and get. But you need to think of the fact that you should do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, no one, I didn't have AAC available when I was a kid that wasn't AIM. Like, that that's another thing. That was actually mm-hmm. a post that I recently wrote and was a one that I really want, that I spent literally years trying to get words out for. Um, The first AAC method I had was AIM. Mm-hmm. Same. I actually we- wrote about it for uh, the autistics typing or whatever it was anthology a long time ago so did i oh wow i didn't write about it well then because i wasn't working words in well but that was also what i wrote about for that um but i wrote one that i liked better recently um but nobody thinks of that as aac yeah Yeah. but it just was Mm -hmm. like do you know Autistic millennials who didn't just grow up a name because so many of us yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean it's a it's a whole joke now that people my age won't pick up the phone anymore because yeah, right? they so overwhelmingly <laughs> prefer text messaging and find text messaging less invasive. Yeah. Um that's because it is. I mean <laughs> <laughs> these are it's these are we're correct. Correct. make sure that it's that you are available right at that moment. Mm-hmm. And yeah, no, it, it, as I've gotten older, it, it not even always because of the advocacy of other disabled people has it gotten a lot easier to be a person who has a hard time on the phone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, not, there's also a lot more web uh, places that you can just like order things online mm-hmm. without yeah. calling anywhere. And make appointments online. And yep. Yeah. Um, um, the for- frequency that I actually use IP relay is approximately if I need to call my doctors because I need to do something faster than waiting the time for them to apply to the online messaging system. Mm-hmm. 
And this is as somebody who uses IP relay because of a speech disability, because I can't reliably use the phone that much. Yeah. Um, I, I want to make a really counterintuitive Sieg and uh, talk about Star Wars a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm the worst autistic and have actually never seen Star Wars. I mean, I've never seen and Star it looks Wars, alike. Good. It's a bunch of white dudes. They all look alike. I can't tell them apart. Except for Yoda. And, and I'm going to talk about except Yoda. Except for Yoda. Okay. So, okay. So everybody likes to quote uh, this thing that Yoda said, and they especially like to quote it at disabled people. Um, and there's, so there's a part, uh, in Star Wars where, uh, Yoda, the Jedi master is, is training Luke, um, in the ways of the force. Uh, and he says, uh, do or do not do, there is no try. Uh, and over the years, <laughs> and over the years, um, Star Wars fans have actually, uh, had a lot of discussion about how a whole lot of Jedi dogma sounds good on the surface and is actually deeply toxic and problematic and um, mm. led to a lot of the problems that probably caused Anakin's fall to the dark side. Um, and one of those, one of those things being uh, do or do not, there is no try. Um, you know, and I, it's, it's something that I make myself a little obnoxious and uh, talk at people every time they say this. Um, but if you are willing to let somebody say that they will try, uh, that opens up so much more freedom and so many more possibilities than if you are giving them a binary option between doing something and not doing something. Um, if those are the only two options you're going to give me and there's no possible halfway point between them, then I'm just going to have to say no a whole lot more often. Um. No, anyway, so uh, I, I think I had mostly um, made the point I wanted to make before the Darth Vader noise uh, <laughs> inter interrupted, which which is that like, willingness to let somebody try and willingness to let uh, somebody promise that they will try but not promise to succeed just opens up um, a range of possibility that doesn't exist in do or do not do. Yeah. That particular this... quote is really popular with gymnastics coaches of the nerdier bent. Mm -hmm. And I say this as a former gymnastics coach <laughs> of the nerdier bent, and it really does on the surface sound really good because um, the theory is that the athlete will commit if they're saying they will do it and they won't commit if they'll try. And yeah, that sounds cool, but does it? So I'm glad to hear that that discourse is happening and also Gymnastics is not life, which is something coaches forget. Like we're talking about much more important things here than a backflip. And I also, didn't... Star Wars isn't life. No, Star Wars is not life. In and, fact, and, and you know, Star Wars was about a bizarre religious sect uh, that has a lot of intensely problematic dogma. <laughs> this connects back to what Cassiano was saying earlier about how people, uh, um, learn, kids, learn from mistakes. If you don't get a chance to try and make a mistake, yeah. then you don't get a chance to learn from those mistakes. If you're only going to do it right, you don't get to make the mistake. And that's the only option. You don't get a chance to make the mistakes that you learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. So um, I know that you, I know that we were going to talk about this too, but for like therapists and like teachers who are working with kids, like what do you want to see them do differently? Um, I don't know who wants to take that first, but first off, I want them to leave kids. Mm -hmm. When the, a kid says something, believe the kid and respect the kid in what they're saying and is true. Mm -hmm. Because when you are thinking that you know better because you're an adult, you don't know what's going on with their body and their mind. And even if you've been taught some other things and know some other things that they don't know, you don't know everything. And they know things that they, you don't know. And you have things to learn too. Mm -hmm. And they will teach you things and you will and both of this is important 
And this starts with the basic part of believing them and listening to them. And you need to listen. Yeah. So um, a lot of the ways that teachers and therapists are taught to interact with disabled kids is the assumption that um, kids will get away, will try to get away with things. They're taught to interact extremely adversarially. And I not just want, but need y'all to start acting as though you understand that um, kids do well when they can. That child is doing the best that they can. And so um, I need y'all to start having some faith in that. And if you don't believe that yet, I need you to be better liars and pretend that you do because that kid is doing the best that they can. And um, give them a little bit of faith. Assume that they are telling you the truth or showing you the truth and they're trying. Um, something that we uh, hear people say a lot is that if, um, if they give kids information or give them language about their disabilities, that they're afraid that they're going to use it as an excuse. Mm. Um, and mm -hmm. I would say to that, that when kids have no possible way of telling you the truth, that's when they have no choice but to come up with excuses. Mm. Um, so, um, you know, again, there's, there, there's a lot of language that it is deeply helpful to have about autism and disability uh, that we're not born with, that doesn't come factory installed. Um, and so giving kids um, access to that kind of information uh, let's them help you understand themselves better instead yeah. of having to come up with excuses. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. And so what about when people want to like push a kid, not maybe even not in a, in a negative way, but just mm -hmm. like, to help them reach their, you know, potential, how, how, how can they do that in a respectful way? Is it, is it just listening? Is there ever a time where it's appropriate to continue pushing if, if someone is saying? So to me, a huge factor in that is whether um, something is in line with a kid's own goals and so there's a mistake that I think gets made a lot when people talk about using a kid's interests to motivate them, uh, in that there is a difference between somebody having a goal or an interest and um, having to figure out what the middle steps are to reaching that goal, as opposed to somebody having a goal or, a, or an interest and that thing being held over their head uh mm -hmm. as uh you can never right. have this mm -hmm. yeah you know basically as you know their their compli their their goals being held hostage to their compliance with however you think they have to get there right um you know so i i a i think it's possible to keep a kid's own long-term goals in mind in helping them figure out like what are the natural steps that they need to take to get what they in fact want. Mm -hmm. um, and there was also, uh, there was a way that certain teachers had with me and I can't tell you all of the ingredients of the magic that made certain people able to do this in a way that worked. But there was a way that certain teachers could basically tell me that they thought I couldn't uh, in a way that would basically guarantee that I would do whatever they were saying they thought I couldn't just to show them that. So I had a like, teacher I have... who did could do who did something similar to that, but without making it into a single people couldn't do things mm -hmm. and made it more general and got it and in particular this was a um about reading a book. And it turned into um so the most like the best example was about reading a book. And so it went into um, 
him saying, well, I can't teach this to the class because I'm because I'm not sure that this is like the right book to teach for the class after being like, maybe I'm teaching this. And that Monday, a lot of the people who were, who just would frequently just not be reading a lot were we all reading that book. Mm-hmm. And so we didn't study it together, but everyone in the class read it. Every so, every person in the class read this book, um, and this was a, a big deal because of the fact that what he was actually doing this entire time was he was supporting people who were learning how to read, mm-hmm. and that was the actual thing that was happening. That wasn't about anything. It was all people needing to learn how to read because they had nobody bothered to teach them until they were in high school. Wow. Because they had just been decided that, oh, you are a disabled black kid. You don't need to learn how to bleed, read. Can I say one thing about this? Mm-hmm. That is an example of other people presuming you can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. There is a big difference yeah. between you saying, I can't do this, and other people saying, you mm-hmm. can't do this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and. Henry... Yeah, Sorry, go, go ahead. No, it's fine. Go. Um, I forgot what I was saying regards, anyways. <laughs> relatable. Um, in regards to the question, first, what's the hurry? Why do you need to push? Um, presumably, we're talking about somebody who's got a lot of, you know, time because there's most things, there's not the rush that early intervention wants you to think there is. Yeah. Second, why do you need to push? You can show, you can lead. Um, I've got an Aikido teacher actually, who's extremely good at instead of pushing, and I actually do respond well to pushing in some circumstances, and that is in fact one of them. But I've got a teacher who is like the master of just like gently showing you where you could be going if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. instead of pushing 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 it's just a gentle lead in that direction and i feel like we could all learn from that when we're working with kids especially kids who tend to get shoved and pulled in directions Mm -hmm. that it is possible to just like gently show so we can try this this is an option available to us to attempt to do yeah um but there's no rush i don't know why people feel the need to push because so many of these skills you can learn later it's fine Part of it, I think, is a systems problem in that the obsession with taking data and showing results and things like that. And when we had um, Stephen Porges recently, he was talking about how the whole system has been like mechanized and it's been less Mm -hmm. about less about the quality of the interactions and more Mm -hmm. about, you know, how many times can we get this in in this window? And, you know, Mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not it's actually beneficial. There was a whole thing about how do you manage to write IEP goals that don't put on about pushing because mm-hmm. that is a huge challenge. Yes. Like it is possible, but you need to actually talk to people about how you do that because it is not something that people know how to do because the actual thing what like what the system is trying to do is about pushing and when pushing is appropriate is when a kid wants it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a, a great, we should um, quote that when we do this because we all need to remember that. We also all need I mean, to know because that is true. Me, but the rest- and just because somebody responds well to pushing in one circumstance doesn't mean they always do. Um, in mm-hmm. my jock things, I actually respond extremely well in specifically my jock mm-hmm. things. I respond fairly well to a little bit of pushing. Anything mm-hmm. else? Nope. Nope, yeah. that is how you get shut down. But, yeah. and so that was, yeah. yes. Yeah, there was parts of, there was some things that work well for pushing for me and most things that mm-hmm. I stop being able to process anything and don't know what to do mm-hmm. because now what I need to do is whatever you say. And mm-hmm. that isn't a way to learn. Mm-hmm. It's specifically the environments where I've been told I can't, or well, sorry, where I have been allowed to say that I can't, where I can handle some pushing. Yep. Right. Because you have trust yeah. that they'll listen. If you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. 
And for this, for me, it's not only the environments where I've been allowed to say I can't. It's where not. It is also where I have had that generalized to where I can trust that this will continue to be true in the future, mm-hmm. which isn't all the same as being allowed to do it once or twice. Yes. Right. So the common theme here is respect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Also, you need to remember that kids are people. Kids are people and they aren't many adults. And when we grow up to be adults, we're not children. Even if we're disabled, we are not children. We are adults. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And kids are going to grow up to adults. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I was going to ask if um, you all had final thoughts and those were good ones but is there anything else <laughs> yeah I think I think mine is just kind of that um again a lot of people want to make this out that we um never celebrate accomplishment or never celebrate when somebody meets a goal um and and that's not the case but it has to be a goal that was actually on their own terms Um, and that they didn't have their autonomy violated in the course of achieving, um, because that's not something to celebrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? There's a thing that I'm trying to figure out if it's actually thematically correct, (laughs) because it's at least thematically adjacent. Go ahead. Yeah. So... There's this trend of taking things that are fun and making them into therapy Mm -hmm. because that, you know, well, then they're doing therapy goals and fun things. And I would really like it if we would stop doing that so that I can celebrate your kid's cartwheel Mm -hmm. or yellow belt or whatever, instead of thinking that you're trying to trick me into celebrating, violating their autonomy. Mm -hmm. Please just let me teach your kid to do a cartwheel or to get their yellow belt instead of trying to make it into therapy. Mm -hmm. I want to, you know, I, yeah, that came out more jumbled than I wanted it to. Um, Yeah. That's okay. I think what you're trying to say is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, of course, kids should still get to do kid things that aren't Mm -hmm. therapy. They should not. Yeah, they should exactly. They're, they should do their fun things and they, that's actually a good place to learn to practice saying I can't is in their regular Mm -hmm. kid things too, because those, the persons they're interacting with there are very used to hearing kids say I can't or Mm -hmm. not yet. So let them practice that with people who are used to hearing it with, from kids. It's Mm -hmm. a good skill. And, um, you know, non-disabled kids are allowed to do things because they are good and fun on their own terms and autistic kids often aren't um mm-hmm. but even among like autistic people my age most of the things that we got really good at are, are not things that we were in for therapy they're they're just the things that we were allowed to do yeah and allowed mm-hmm. to explore doing and so like a lot of somebody's increase in capability um you know there are things that therapy can help with and there are kinds of therapy that i wish i might have had Um, but most of the ability that really matters to me, uh, did not come because of somebody not listening to me say, I can't do this. So the things that I got from therapy generally was harmful. And the things Mm -hmm. that I, the places where I learned stuff that included long-term stuff as well as that was I being able to learn that I could ever say I can't as or these were stuff that I enjoy and that I enjoy things or these are things that I'm good at or ways to combine all of these were when I just did stuff because I wanted to Mm. or because where a teacher would say hey you're good at this, but not that. Do you want me to help you with this? And they explicitly asked me, this is the goal that I have for you. Do you want me to support you in that goal? And they stepped me through telling me what they wanted for me and gave me the choice. 
And that wasn't something I had frequently. Frequently, it was just people deciding for me what I should have. But sometimes I had a teacher be like, this is something you should, that I think is something that would be good for you. Do you, do you agree that this is something that should be done? And those were when I actually got support and that made large changes in my life. And mm-hmm. that's like, that's where the most support I got for learning socialization. That's where I got learned, like, lo- so not, that wasn't any of the social skills therapy. That was a teacher mm-hmm. deciding, hey, you already know all of this material. Do you want to learn how to teach it to the class? Wow. Mm-hmm. Like, Bing. it was. It, it wasn't things that were all of the putting in me in therapy. It was people trying to help me with my choice and my decision. Mm-hmm. When, and where they explicitly told me I can't was an option. Yeah. Being allowed to be super bad at something and then work through it was honestly way better for me than pretty much anything else because I was bad at gymnastics when I started but nobody tried to take it away because I said I couldn't once. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so much of this is about not having things done to you, but doing things with you. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. That is is like the entire thing. (laughs) (laughs) Kids frequently have stuff done to them, like all kids. Not just disabled kids, all kids frequently have stuff done to them. And then when you're disabled, that's done a lot more. Yeah. And, you know, again, uh, like uh, like the cartoon that we're discussing, I think a lot of teachers post these things and and honestly don't intend for them to be taken that way. But the fact is, Those are the experiences that uh, a lot of us have had with that kind of rhetoric around ability. Um, And and so, you know, it's important to realize that, like, just that's that's the painful history that a lot of us have with those images, Um, you know, and people who were people were surprised who simply didn't have um, a lot of conversation with disabled adults about the ways that those things have been used against us. Yeah. It's a perfect example. And I've said this before, but (laughs) why the rest of us have to live by nothing about us without us. Mm. Because we don't. Also another example of you need disabled friends. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Well, I just want to thank all of you so much for sharing your experiences and your wisdom and you make the world a better place. And I know that I'm very grateful for all of you. So thank you so much for setting this up. This was fun. Of course.